Ladies and gentlemen, I take great pleasure in introducing that exponent of perpetual youth, famous to the world of sports and entertainment, Gentleman Jim, Mr. James J. Corbett. Around the turn of the 20th century, James J. Corbett had a reasonable claim to be the most famous man on the planet. As heavyweight champion of the world, he transformed boxing from bare-knuckle brawling to a respectable sport. Then, when the theater became the most popular form of entertainment in America's burgeoning cities, Corbett repeated the trick. As one of the pioneers of vaudeville, he was the highest paid stage actor of his day, who then moved on to become one of the first matinee idols. His is the classic rendition of the American dream, emerging from the tough streets of San Francisco's Irish Quarter to become a national hero. When I was 17 years old, I was the amateur heavyweight champion of the Pacific Coast. And nine years after that, I won the heavyweight championship of the world. And it only shows what a boy can do when he just takes care of himself. The Corbetts had farmed the land around Ballycushine and County Mayo since the early 1600s. By the mid-19th century, it was a way of life that no longer worked. Living off the land was becoming more and more difficult. Like every other family in the parish, the Corbetts started leaving Ireland for America. In 1854, 18-year-old Patrick Corbett followed other family members to New Orleans, but his arrival coincided with a yellow fever epidemic in the state of Louisiana. His older brother, John, died of the disease, so he fled west to one of the wildest towns in the Union, San Francisco. It's a rough city. There are a couple of vigilante movements in the 1850s. People are kicked out of the city. Some are hung by these vigilantes because it's a wide open city with a lot of crime and, and stuff going on. But it does have this kind of opportunity, particularly to move up. And so Irish people are pretty successful in major businesses, major banks, buying real estate, um, and also in politics. The vast majority of the Irish who ended up in San Francisco were what's called the two boat Irish. 5% or thereabouts of the Irish who would have ended up in San Francisco in the 1850s and 1860s came directly from Ireland. And most of those would have come based on the fact that they had a relative who was already living in San Francisco. So the vast majority were coming from mostly the East Coast. Patrick Corbett would have been a bit of an exception coming from New Orleans, for example. But they were coming from mostly uh, Boston, Philadelphia, and New York. And when they got to San Francisco, the welcome was very, very different because this was a totally new society. It was a society being built up more or less from scratch. It was a hierarchy of money. Now, I know America initially was a hierarchy of money, but by the time the Irish got there in the 1840s, it was also a hierarchy of birth. So you had that kind of bigoted attitude towards the Irish. You didn't get that in San Francisco. Francisco. Patrick Corbett settled into the city and took a job taxing people around as a hack driver. He eventually built up a livery stable and an undertaking business and met and married another immigrant, Catherine MacDonald from Dublin. Initially, when the Irish got there, they would have settled in particular areas. They would, for example, there would have been a lot of Irish in the what's known as south of the slot or south of Market. The slot was this railway line running along Market Street, and that's where they would originally have settled. But they very quickly became very upwardly mobile, and when they became upwardly mobile, they began to spread out and they began to move into different areas. You can see that, for example, with the with the Corbett family in particular, because as 
more and more kids are added to the brood, they tend to move. But the interesting thing is they can afford to move. So initially, yes, they would have been in uh, south of market, the area south of market, probably extending no further to the west than about 7th Street, what became in the 1860s uh, politically, it, became, it was the first ward. Uh, but then they, they started to spread out after that as they, uh, as they moved up the, the hierarchy moved up the pecking order and as they, as they began to make more money. Despite his mother's long-standing wish for her son to enter the priesthood, it was pretty clear that James was not destined for a life of service to the church. An old school report describes an exceptionally friendly boy who was too free with his fists. He was described as a fair to average student, but he wasn't trying to get into too many rows and fist fights. So it's um, was an indication of what was to come, I suppose. And uh, but the result of these um, school by exploits was that he was expelled from two schools, and he, he went out to work when he was only 14. His father then knew a cashier, I think it was at the Nevada Bank in San Francisco. So he got Jim in there initially as a messenger boy, and he worked his way up to become. Uh, assistant teller, which was a good job, pensionable job, but that's not what Jim wanted. Sitting behind his desk with a with grill in front of him, he says he caught his first glimpse of the well-to-do people with their gold watches and their elegant dress style. He says, that's something I swear to. He enjoyed fighting from a young age, you know, as some young lads do. And eventually, a man by the name of Denny Dillon started actually giving him boxing lessons and eventually said, you're good enough that you could come to the Olympic Club and do very well there. The Olympic Club in San Francisco was the first of its kind in America, a gentleman's hangout for drinking, dining, dancing, and training. It also sponsored a range of different sports, and Corbett became the club's boxing instructor. It had sort of an elitist feel to it. They were all amateurs, which was considered a higher endeavor, higher level, you know, that you were a gentleman if you were a, an amateur. Back then it had this sort of lofty status. Versus a pro, you were considered a pug, you were considered just someone out for money. So when Corbett came to this Olympic Athletic Club, he was considered actually a, a gentleman by performing in these athletic events. Boxing, or pugilism as it was known then, became popular with the British upper classes in the 18th century as a piece of gory entertainment with the added bonus that you could gamble on the outcome. It would be another century before the sport made its way to America. Former slave Tom Molyneux became the first well-known American fighter at a time when boxing took hold in the Deep South. Plantation owners, having enjoyed the sport in England, pitted their strongest slaves against each other in battles for physical supremacy. The Protestant establishment in the U.S. was outraged at the violence and criminality of bare-knuckle boxing, and the sport was outlawed. There was a puritanical streak in the U.S., and uh, prize fighting was looked down upon, and prize fighters even more. They were of the lower classes, toughs, in many cases, criminals, and looked down upon that way. Boxing was illegal just about every place. It was looked upon as a degrading, brutal endeavor. Even though it was popular in England, the Puritan ethic was still quite strong in America. So you had churches basically uh, against the sport, although the sport was popular in, in the same way uh, gambling was popular. So there was this struggle between a popular sport that uh, the, the governmental authorities viewed as maybe damaging to the society. By the 1880s, boxing began to move up, mostly due to one individual, and that was John L. Sullivan. Sullivan. L. Sullivan. And I can lick any man in the world. John L. Sullivan 
was, I believe, the first sports superstar. His dramatic wins, his uh, hitting prowess was a, but these were tremendous parts of it. But then he went on an exhibition tour during the season of 1883-84, meeting all comers. And uh, a tremendous amount of publicity was garnered that way. And the legend of John L. took root, not only among fight people, but among the average citizen. He had a lot to do with popularizing the sport and making it more acceptable at the same time that the Marcus of Queensbury rules took hold. Bare knuckle boxing was an extremely brutal, if you can call it a sport, but the Marcus of Queensbury rules, which mandated the use of boxing gloves, a three minute round, separated by a one minute rest period, whereas bare knuckle boxing was always a fight to the finish and a round only ended when somebody was knocked down or thrown to the ground. So you had these forces coming together where you had a, an extremely popular champion with new rules that created this sort of veneer of civility. I mean, boxing was still very brutal, but people felt a little better about it. Corbett became a professional fighter when the sport was illegal in pretty much every state in the Union. Gentleman Jim was leaving the affluent confines of the Olympic Club for the life of a prize fighter. On July 3rd, 1886, in Utah, Corbett turned pro using the assumed name of Jim Dillon. He was trying to hide the fact that he was turning pro because he wanted to maintain his amateur status. And once you turn pro, you can't go back to being an amateur. And the Olympic would essentially expel him. To become a professional boxer was to become a criminal. Prize fights had to be staged outside city limits and county lines. And some were even staged in barns or on river barges to evade the eyes of the law. Despite the fact that venues were kept secret, with only newspaper reporters and invited guests as spectators, word of their location often leaked out. On the 30th of May, 1889, Corbett was matched with Joe Kowinski at a barn in San Anselmo, California. But just after six rounds, the county sheriff turned up and stopped the fight. Well, six days after that fight was stopped in the barn by the sheriff, we were notified that uh, we were to finish the fight, but we didn't know where. I was taken uh, to an empty house. We were sitting in the house, and one of the fellows said, well, we're going to fight out on a barge. Well, I got into the ring with my three-ounce gloves on my hand, then Kowinski didn't have any gloves on at all. Well, that was done to try and force me to fight without gloves, knowing that I had an injured hand. Well, I knew Kowinski was going to rush me because he figured I only had one hand. So I just set myself a straight left hand punch. By beating men like Joe Kowinski, Corbett became the biggest draw in West Coast boxing. His only rival being Peter Jackson, who moved from Australia to San Francisco to teach boxing at the California Athletic Club. Jackson was seen as a worthy contender for a shot at Sullivan's world title. But John L. swore to fight any man in the world, providing he wasn't black. Sullivan, as champion, uh, drew the color line which meant that he believed or said for public consumption that fighting a black man was unnatural in a way. He, he felt that it was beneath him to fight a black man. Clearly a prejudicial view held by many people at the time. Now you must understand that this is less than 20 years after the Civil War ended. Blacks had a long way to go to achieve equality and although Blacks achieved a measure of equality in boxing more than any other sport. They were still held back in many ways. Corbett came along and he agreed to fight Jackson. Uh, 
to Sullivan's disgust, he says, what are you doing fighting this man? He says, no, I'm going to give him a chance. Now, on the surface, showing that he was less racially biased than Sullivan, but this is not the case. In his heart, he said, if I can beat Jackson, Sullivan has to fight me. So in May of 1891, Corbett met Peter Jackson in San Francisco. Demand for seats was so high that tickets sold for anything up to $50, the highest prices ever paid for a boxing match at that time. They say it was a good fight for about 30 rounds. And after that, it became extremely dull because they were so tired that they, neither guy could knock the other out. And neither wanted to take a chance of trying to knock the other guy out lest they get caught in a fatigued state or wear themselves out more trying to knock the other guy out. So they were both extremely cautious for about 30 rounds. And they got so sick of it. People were leaving, people were going to sleep. So finally they stopped it. And, and the, by calling it a no contest, what it did functionally was saying is it was almost that like they hadn't fought. Well, everyone knew they had fought. It was a four hour fight. But by calling it a no contest, they didn't have to pay them. Corbett may have been shortchanged after 61 rounds against Jackson. But that fight did establish him as a credible contender for a shot at the title. He'd shown that he could go the distance in a grueling fight, and now there'd be the backing for a challenge to the great John L. In those days, there weren't what you would call ratings of fighters. A fighter established a reputation by beating other fighters who already had a reputation. So, it, it was really different than today. You can't compare it to today. A fighter would issue a challenge to someone. It could be a public challenge in a newspaper. Interest would be aroused. The fight would be made. Backers would put up the money. All right. Sign it, John. Right here. I'd rather fight one than take all, but if Tug Collins is afraid to, it's all right with me. Might make for a better fight. He'd have to come up with a lot of money. He'd have to get an athletic club willing to put up a big purse, and he'd have to get financial backers to be willing to put up enough money for a side bet to make it worth Sullivan's interest. What happened was with Corbett, he did have some professional fights that put his name on the map as an elite fighter. His performances in those fights made enough people feel that he had a shot with Sullivan, that they were willing to put up the money to back him. Tired of being derided for not defending his title, Sullivan said he would fight any contender for a winner-take-all purse of $25,000 plus a side bet of $10,000 each. The winner would walk away with $45,000. But it meant that in order to meet Sullivan, the challenger had to at least come up with $10,000. Corbett and his manager, William A. Brady, quickly raised the money and requested a shot at the crown. The Olympic Club in New Orleans agreed to stage the fight, and it was set for September 7th, 1892. A man who is an athlete is a man who is a credit to his community and the country. For athletics demand clean living and temperate appetites. It gives me great pleasure to present this diamond belt to John Lawrence Sullivan, of Boston. Sullivan had not fought since 1889, and the Sullivan-Corbett fight was in September of 1892, so he had been inactive for three years, so people wanted to see Sullivan, Sullivan fight again. John, I'll be frank. The only reason I've agreed to put you in condition is because I think that unless you're in the best shape of your life, this fellow Corbett will win. <clears throat> And when you're in your early 30s and you haven't fought in three years and you've been drinking a little bit too much during those years and not training at all, fighting in a fight to the finish is not easy on the body. We're not talking 12 rounds like today. We're talking until you get knocked out. What made this fight different, and this is why it's historic, it was the first match conducted, the first heavyweight championship bout conducted under the Marcus of Queensbury rules mandating gloves, three-minute rounds, one-minute rest. No time limit. It, it was a finish fight. But those rules, the gloves, the three-minute rounds, very much like our modern day. Corbett could never have fought bare knuckle. He wasn't rugged enough. It wasn't in his psyche to fight bare knuckle. He was a Marcus of Queensbury fighter. Never fought bare knuckle in his life. Sullivan had fought bare knuckle, but he'd also fought Queensbury. Corbett's style was essentially defensive, and Sullivan was known as a puncher. 
and how do you beat a puncher? It's either you have to outpunch him, or if you're not as big of a puncher as he is, you have to outbox him and out, out slick him and finesse him and use defense. And that's what Corbett was. He was the fast footed, quick boxer who used a lot of speed and timing and footwork and defense to make the puncher miss. So really for the first several rounds of the fight, Corbett wasn't really interested in hitting Sullivan so much as he was more interested in making sure that Sullivan didn't hit him. Corbett had been setting up Sullivan in his mind that he was making Sullivan think that he was so afraid of him and that he had no punch that Sullivan was getting almost too brave for his own good and Corbett eventually was looked to time Sullivan and figure out exactly when Sullivan was, was stepping into his range and Corbett then fired a huge left hand right into Sullivan's nose and broke it and then he, he followed up with a big combination and let Sullivan know that he had a punch too. And from then on, he was using his jab and, and stick and move style to just gradually wear Sullivan down. Sullivan himself claimed afterwards that Corbett had no punch and that he was never hurt at any time in the fight. Well, in the 20th round, Corbett started really pounding on Sullivan and almost had him out. But Sullivan could really take a beating, and he proved in that fight that he had a lot of toughness. People didn't know that about him so much because usually he just mowed his opponents down. In this fight, he took just a, a gradual beating. In the 21st round, Corbett figured out that he had him and really attacked him ferociously because Sullivan was just about done for. Sullivan, I don't know if he was ever knocked down in his career. He was considered unbeatable. In the 21st round, when Corbett finally lands the punches that knock him out, the referee begins the count. The crowd is cheering. By the count of two or three, the crowd suddenly goes silent, as if they can't believe what is happening here. Here's this legend, this myth, and he's being counted out? Nine, ten. Sullivan had been, to the average American, unbeatable. And here was this young man, 26 at the time, who had been an assistant bank teller in San Francisco when he comes in and just beats the living daylights out of John L. It was a tremendous shock. I was beaten fair and square. I'm glad that I was beaten by an American and that the championship stays in America. God bless you, John. We all love you. It was the downfall of a national idol, the downfall of the first sports superstar. In dramatic fashion, it was the end in the popular mind of the bare-knuckle era, the end of a sport. You're a handy lad. What a fight we'd have made of it when I was your age. Take good care of the title. Stay on the level. I'll do that, Mr. Solomon. Corbett, even though he didn't write the Queensbury rules that had been written a quarter of a century before, effectively creates a new sport. And boxing now becomes a commercial sport of the cities. The first nocturnal sport, popular sport, that is covered, uh, that uh, people go to. In point of fact, you could make a, a very good case for boxing being the national sport of the U.S. Each heavyweight champion is representative of his era. Sullivan was very representative of America at that time. The, the relentless energy, the combativeness, a country just finding its, itself and he was almost a living embodiment of this era in, in America's history. And Sullivan, in losing to Corbett, it wasn't that America wasn't maintaining it, it was that America was refining itself. It was now becoming part of the world. So Corbett really was representative of his era, in a way, um, of something that was changing, changing in a very profound way. America was, the world was changing in a profound way. 
And boxing always mirrors the society that surrounds it. To be the heavyweight champion was, at this time, to be the most famous man in the world. And James J. Corbett wasted no time in cashing in on his celebrity. He took to the stage, initially just to pose and regale the audience with tales of his exploits in the ring. Corbett's manager, Bill Brady, commissioned a play to be written, Gentleman Jack, in which the champion appeared mostly in evening wear to emphasize his sophisticated image. And with the boxing gloves safely tucked away, the heavyweight champion and his manager took Gentleman Jack across the Atlantic. In the summer of 1894, Corbett set sail for his ancestral home, and he persuaded his parents to take the trip with him. They had not seen Ireland since they had left 40 years previously. Ireland was the final leg of Jim's European tour. And Gentleman Jack opened at the Queen's Theatre Dublin in July 1894, with one newspaper commenting on the large number of women in the audience. His parents had returned to America by this time, but by now his wife, Ollie, had joined him. She was reluctant to go on tours with him. She was the dutiful wife, stayed at home, leaving him free to go and do as he pleased. And of course, he took full advantage of this. Yeah, the one picture of Jim and his wife shows him not, not looking at all happy. He brought her over to Ireland with some reluctance. It was probably because the family wanted to see the wife and there. Uh, so to upkeep the pretense that he was in a happy marriage, uh, she came along because it meant he restricted his philandering. Gentleman Jack played in theatres throughout the country. But it was in Ballinrobe, his father's hometown, that Corbett's appearance generated the most excitement. The proceeds of the single presentation were donated to his uncle, the Reverend James Corbett, parish priest of the nearby village of Partry. The money raised was enough to do repairs to the church and to build a little wall, a small wall around the church, which is still, still to be seen. And a plaque was installed saying, yeah, just donated by James J. Corbett, heavyweight champion of the world, etc. But a few years later, when Uncle Jim got to hear that Jim had been divorced, he uh, flew into a bit of a rage, ordered that the plaque be removed, cast into exterior darkness, as they say and wanted to sort of remove all vestiges of Corbett's visit. But the one thing he did leave was a stained glass window, which Jim had donated, and that's there to this day. Having visited his father's birthplace, Jim returned to Dublin to find his mother's family with a little help from the local press. He was um, put an article in one of the papers that he would like to see where his mother's people came from. So my great-grandfather, Patrick Gunning, um, re re replied. And um, he met him anyway, and he actually stayed with him in Charlton Terrace, Inchicore Road. And because they used to keep um, lodgers in them days. And he came up to the works. And up to Inchicore Works, there was flags and there was buntings out. To finish off then, of course, what would it be? It wouldn't be Ireland without a drink. And my great-grandfather was supposed to be very witty, and he said, well, you fought many rounds, but here's a round you won't stand. And Gentleman Jim was supposed to put money on the counter and buy a round for everyone in the club. Corbett's reign as heavyweight champion coincided with an invention that would transform the world of sports and entertainment. In 1891, Thomas Edison patented the motion picture camera. Cinema was born, and from the very beginning, boxing and the movies were a great match. Pretty early on, almost every major, and minor for that matter, studio in the States, and well, before there were studios, filmmakers recognize if you're just planning the camera and you have 60 to 90 seconds, a nice contained action with a guaranteed outcome, natural conflict, human subject figures being the baseline. It's, uh, it's a, just modularly, it's a great match in that sense. And the earliest films had very limited running times, so to do a multiple installment round by round film was also very 
convenient match. Jim Corbett, you know, shortly after he becomes champion, can be offered a you know, six-figure contract by the Edison Film Studio to come and pose for a sparring match. And you know, 1894, the very earliest uh, year for moving pictures, he's the first significant celebrity to appear before cameras. And because he has this contract and gets residuals and everything else, it's very easy to talk about Jim Corbett as being the first movie star. They offered Corbett nearly $5,000 to do this, which back then was humongous money. And they told Peter Courtney that he'd get paid $250, but he could get another 250 bonus if he could last six rounds. The ring was only 14 feet square, and it was in the studio, and there's two ropes, and the, and the ring went up right up to the walls of, of the uh, studio. Even though there's black all around for the filming, the top allowed sunlight to come in, because they didn't have lighting back then sufficient to film. Technically, it was illegal because New Jersey, in New Jersey, boxing was illegal, and they had to keep it on the download. And when what, when the law found out about that exhibition, they, they actually tried to get a grand jury to indict them, but the grand jury would not return the indictment. Well, boxing is beneficial not alone to the health, but is also beneficial in a great many other ways. That I found out from my own personal experience. It is one of the healthiest exercises you could possibly take up. And when you feel that you are capable of defending yourself through life and that no one can dominate you physically as things come up through life, it gives you that confidence in yourself that not alone physically, but also mentally. It also gives you poise and grace. Jim Corbett changed the public role of a champion, dressing well and greeting the world with a smile instead of the scowl worn by the old-time brawlers. His Gentleman Jim image worked with similar success on the stage, and in these early days of audiences seeking out nighttime entertainment in America's new cities, Corbett was instrumental in making both boxing and theater highly commercial and profitable ventures. Corbett was doubtless the most successful actor-boxer of all time. Even before he beat Sullivan, his manager, William Brady, who later became the dean of Broadway producers, incidentally, was uh, producing him in plays. And of course, uh, fights were uh, few and far between in those days. And uh, you could make more money on a continuous basis, certainly, as an actor. And the idea was, in this day, before there was television, before there was radio, before there were even motion pictures, you know, as we know them, the only way anyone could be seen was on the stage. So if you were a celebrity and you wanted to cash in on the celebrity, you went on the stage. Corbett was considered quite good and doubtless improved as he went. It's part of that whole second generation phenomenon of uh, moving in, taking, and kind of not just embracing, uh, you know, American popular culture, but making it. I mean, it's not that they are, somehow there's an American popular culture out there and they somehow participate in it. It's they actually are shaping it. They are making it themselves. Uh, there's a, a song where a bunch of second generation Irish guys sing, we, are, we all fellows brand new. Uh, we all fellows brand new. We know what's hip, what's cool in America. We write the, we wear the right clothes. We, we talk the right talk. We sing the right songs, not those, waspy farm boys out in Iowa. Um, we are the guys who are in charge. Apart from one title defense against Englishman Charlie Mitchell in 1894, Corbett confined his appearances in the ring largely to a series of exhibitions until nearly five years into his reign as champion, a challenger emerged who forced him to put his title on the line. What he wanted to do and what he did was milk that title for all it was worth to go on the stage, to go on the vaudeville circuit, make personal appearances. He made a fortune doing that without risking his title. The only time Corbett risked his title was when he felt public opinion was veering against him, that he was heavyweight champion. Hey, it's time to defend your title. And then he sort of picked and chose his, his opponents, uh, beating Charlie Mitchell, which you know was his, wasn't measured up to Corbett at, at all, and making the mistake of fighting Fitzsimmons, who he thought he would defeat. Bob Fitzsimmons held the world middleweight title, and he had a big reputation. 
Corbett had to accept this challenge to remain a credible champion. Making the match was delayed because Fitzsimmons faced a manslaughter charge for his part in the death of a sparring partner. He was a dominant middleweight champion. He was knocking guys out left and right. I mean, he could box you, he could punch you, and he just had phenomenal skills and phenomenal power. People were just amazed at his knockouts. And he beat a lot of good middleweight. There were a lot of good middleweights back then, so he was impressively knocking these guys out. So he was considered as someone who could step up to the heavyweight division and had enough power to do it. Eventually, he did fight some heavyweights, like Joe Koyinski, who was known as a really top heavyweight and had given Corbett a 27-round you know, war and fits him and stopped him in five rounds. Corbett finally accepted Fitzsimmons' challenge, and the fight was made for Carson City, Nevada, on St. Patrick's Day, 1897. Fact is, Jim, people are just as civilized up here as any place else. As soon as they seen us, they busted loose just as wild as San Francisco, after we licked Sullivan. Nice people, Jim. Awfully nice. Wonder if that's our ranch, right ahead there. Well, they don't look as described, but we'll stop anyway and see if we're on the right road. Whoa. You know, people up here don't see a world's champion every day. It'll give them something to tell their grandkids about. <laughs> Quiet, Tiger. Quiet. Oh, I'll be able to handle him all right. And it's beautiful, the uh, dog, huh? I'm looking for the Duchess Wentworth Ranch. Oh, well, you can't miss it if you just keep straight ahead. Uh, why are you going there? Well, you see, ma'am, that's uh, Jim Corbett, the world's champion. I'm Billy Delaney, his manager, and we're going back. Oh, you are, are you? Take him back, I take him. Get him out of the oh, oh, oh. Nevada was almost bankrupt at the time. It stays as a rich mining center long past, and a title fight was a potential windfall. Although boxing was illegal there, a friendly state governor quickly drew up a bill to clear the way. And in consideration thereof, the duly incorporated municipality of Carson City, by authority granted by the laws of the state of Nevada, hereby undertakes and agrees to provide facilities for the aforesaid boxing contest between James J. Corbett and Robert Fitzsimmons. The said municipality further promises to maintain order and at all times to protect the lives and the persons of the state of Nevada. This was the real Wild West. Carson City was a frontier town, and the clergy and moral legislators were outraged at the prospect of a prize fight promoting further criminality. <coughs> to make matters worse, the showdown was being stoked up by the press, who were given plenty of material by Corbett and Fitzsimmons as they became increasingly hostile to each other as the fight neared. Oh, Mr. Corbett, Mr. Fitzsimmons is here to see you. I got it in my head to come over and pay me respects, Corbett. Well, but why, it was a joy to hear you had not run out as expected. I, indeed, it takes a brave man to show up to take a beating. Run out? Beating? Ah, the altitude up here must have gone to your head, Fitzsimmons. It ain't me head you're worried about, Corbett. It's me fist. Uh, those fly swatters? Fly swatters, you call them. What kind of a fly do you call Choinsky? What kind of a fly was... Choinsky? Oh, yes. Didn't he have you on the canvas in the third round? I thought you said Fitzsimmons had a reputation, Billy. Here he is bragging about beating a guy that almost licked him. Why, when he goes down, it's from force of habit. Why, oh, are you... Oh, wait, gentlemen, gentlemen, you can settle this St. Patrick's Day. Now, wait for... They definitely did not like each other. Fitzsimmons thought that Corbett was a, a coward and, and a pretty boy and didn't really know how to punch and was, you know, more of an actor than a fighter. And Corbett was pretty upset by that. And then they got into a little bit of a fracas, you know, with the, the, the bodyguards and the seconds and the, the hangers-on, you know, were mixing it up. And, and, and Corbett... Um, was held back, and then he spit at Fitzsimmons, and he even admitted it, saying, I, you know, I was being held back. I would have punched him in the face if I could, but instead they were holding me, so I had to spit at him. The deal to put this fight together was a throwback to prize fighting's past and a glimpse into the future of how professional sports would be run. Corbett and Fitzsimmons 
fought for a purse and a side bet in much the same way as their bare-knuckle predecessors had done for over a century. But for this part, they were also to get a share of the motion picture rights. The Veriscope Company planned to shoot what was at that time the longest feature film ever made. Such was the epic scale of the production that a new arena had to be specially built on a racetrack outside Carson City to ensure there was enough daylight for the cameraman. But by the time 1897 rolls around, St. Patrick's Day in Carson City, the camera there is a brand new technology, a special widescreen proprietary film format called the Veriscope, uh, which was developed specifically to record prize fights, and this prize fight in specific. And so it's, when that film was successfully recorded, it was by far the longest motion picture ever recorded of a single subject at that time. It had more than one camera at ringside, uh, but just to capture almost every minute of the action and some of the before and after action was pretty amazing. The local sheriff had rounded up all roughnecks, hobos, and small-time conmen and put them in jail to keep them away from the respectable folk arriving for the fight, while legendary lawmen and gunslingers Wyatt Earp and Bat Masterson were at the ringside. Masterson was the dapper timekeeper, captured forever on film in his famous bowler hat, tending the ring bell. Fitzsimmons was a puncher, and he was trying to set Corbett up for a big punch. And Corbett was the beautiful boxer, and he was trying to outbox Fitzsimmons. For most of the fight, Corbett was, was sticking and moving and being effective, but Fitzsimmons, he had discussed before the fight that, hey, he might outbox me, but he's not going to knock me out, and this is a fight to the finish. The first knockdown in the fight took place in the sixth round, and Corbett dropped Fitzsimmons. Corbett later said that it was a long count, and it's actually the first long count controversy in boxing history, not the Jack Dempsey, Gene Tunney fight. What happened was Fitzsimmons went down in a funny way. He grabbed Corbett by the waist and the legs as he was going down. So it took a moment for the referee to kind of really recognize the fact that he truly was down. So a couple seconds elapsed. There was a, a rule saying that you have to step back from your opponent, and, the, and the Corbett wasn't stepping back the way the referee was asking him to. So that caused a couple seconds also to elapse. So really, Fitzsimmons may have been given something like a 14-second count. Corbett is considered the father of modern scientific boxing, which puts him at a certain strata, a certain level. Fitzsimmons was a great fighter. In fact, experts up to the mid-20th century were rating Fitzsimmons among the top 10 heavyweights of all time. He was a very unusual fighter, almost a freak of nature. Fitzsimmons gradually wore Corbett down. I mean, Corbett was hitting him, but he wasn't hurting him. And Fitzsimmons was pressing the action, shooting his powerful blows and little by little was getting to Corbett. In fact, there's some reports to say that he even knocked one of Corbett's teeth out. In the 14th round, Corbett wasn't moving quite as much, he wasn't punching quite as much, and Fitzsimmons set him up for a beautiful left hook to the body that knocked him out. It was a shock. It was a shock to certainly to Corbett and his family. Fitzsimmons' body attack, uh, you know, again, it was another indication of the sport progressing. And also, I think it was an indication of how far Jim had gone back. Because he'd officially announced his retirement about a year or so, pardon me, after the Mitchell fight. And he'd been an actor, and this had consumed most of his time and energy. And I believe that the uh, Corbett who lost to Fitzsimmons was a Corbett who was well below par. It's not losing the fight, Billy. The Blazers of the championship. It's letting you down. After all you've told me about not getting overconfident and waiting in wide open. Oh, forget it. We'll get a return match and you then... You heard what he told the reporters? He said he wouldn't fight me again. So what? You're still the greatest of the lot. And 50 years from now, when other champions are forgotten, They'll always remember Gentleman Jim Corbett. Oh, land sake, Red, where you been keeping yourself all day? Oh, business of one kind or another kept me busy elsewhere. I'm sure sorry to hear about what happened this afternoon, Mr. Corbett. Not that I'm any expert, but uh, if you should get another crack at him, I tried out a punch this afternoon that might work. A right, right here. Yeah, we already heard about a writer. Also this afternoon, 
a right to the solar plexus. Oh. Now, he says he won't give us a return match, but he will. And next time, we'll pull the punch. Oh. Well, what are you doing down there? One, two, three. <laughs> For quite some time after his defeat, Corbett was inconsolable. He had lost his precious title and had made no money from the winner-take-all fight. And then things just got worse for Gentleman Jim when the press and public turned against him for his unsportsmanlike reaction to the loss of his title. After the fight was over, Corbett had gotten up and attacked Fitzsimmons even after the fight, wanting to continue the fight. And so when the films were shown of the fight and Fitzsimmons was in the audience, he would stand up and say, ladies and gentlemen, take a look at what a gentleman Corbett is. And people would laugh, you know, because he wasn't acting like a gentleman. He wasn't taking it taking the loss very well. He didn't say, I was beaten by the better man. Corbett was saying, I ah, just knocked me out with a fluke punch. You couldn't repeat it again. And let's have a rematch. Within a few months of losing to Fitzsimmons, Corbett was back in training. He'd moved to New Jersey to prepare for a fight with another leading fighter of the day, Kid McCoy. But on August 16, 1898, a shocking dispatch arrived from San Francisco. Jim's father, Pat Corbett, had taken a revolver and killed his wife before turning the gun on himself. One theory was that heavy drinking had taken its toll. But there was another rumor that Corbett Sr. had lost everything he had in betting on his son to beat Fitzsimmons. People back then speculate as to why that happened. Some said it was because he was in debt or that he'd lost his money betting on Corbett. Other people say that he had an alcohol problem. Some said that um, he had been acting strange lately and, and that there was maybe something not right with his head. But there's other thinking that Mr. Corbett had some mental issues that it may have been hereditary because Corbett's own sister had spent time in an insane asylum. And that they said that Corbett himself had fits of rage and that he had these sort of moments of insanity. So they think that maybe that Mr. Corbett just went insane and, and killed her. While Corbett came to terms with his personal tragedies, the film of his fight with Fitzsimmons, now called the Battle of the Century, thrilled audiences throughout the United States. And for the first time, a motion picture was shown in high-class theaters, such as Chicago's Grand Opera House and the Boston Theater. The vast majority of viewers had never seen a boxing match before, yet audiences would break into applause at the action. Every day there was almost uh, some kind of coverage of what the two boxers were doing, but also what's happening to the films. So that when it finally was released, there was an eager public to see it. And the other thing that set it apart from anything, anything that had preceded it was a turnout of women who wanted to watch the film reproduction of the fight, principally because it was Jim Corbett, and he was known as a, a matinee idol on the stage. So there was kind of a, a reason to justify allowing women to see what otherwise would have been an improper entertainment. So the movies and prize fighting kind of are born at a time when they need each other to legitimate one another. Boxing becomes popular among a much broader class because of motion picture replay and the movies which are seeking legitimacy are also trying to get some of that by capitalizing and becoming known as a thing. But of course that's a double-edged sword because they also are participating in a blood sport Fitzsimmons never gave Corbett his rematch, despite Jim's best attempts at goading his rival into a fight. But as is the way in boxing, champions come and go. And when Fitzsimmons eventually lost the crown to Jim Jeffries, Corbett's chance to regain his old title had arrived. Jeffries had actually been a Corbett sparring partner before the Fitzsimmons fight. Jeffries was fairly new to the game at that point, but he was a big, strong dude. He could take a punch, he could dish a punch, and he was learning the trade. Over the next several years, Jeffries developed his skills further, won a lot of fights, beat Fitzsimmons, beat Sharkey, and now Corbett's saying, hey, this guy used to be my sparring partner. I should be able to beat him. So he was motivated for the fight. He thought it was a fight he could win. So he trained actually nearly a year. When he was doing his plays and his exhibitions, he was also training on the side, trying to get himself into top shape. And everyone that saw him in the training camp said that this guy has really you know, rejuvenated himself. He looks fantastic. His body looks great. His sparring looks great. He, this guy's really recaptured what he once had. Corbett goes into the Jeffries fight, and, and uh, 
boxes rings around Jeffries for quite some time, but Jeffries has this calm, methodical style because it's a 25 round fight. So he knows, he knows that Corbett wants you to try to wear yourself out trying to hit him. Late in the fight, about the 17th round, Corbett started slowing down and fading a little bit. Jeffries started attacking even more ferociously in the last, next several rounds. And in the 23rd round, he finally caught up to Corbett, hit him a left hook on the jaw and knocked him out. But the fact that Corbett had boxed so well for 23 rounds and given a great fight and great account of himself actually raised his esteem in, in many people's minds that he was able to do so well. The world loves a gallant loser, and Corbett was never more popular than after his heroic defeat to Jeffries. But the acclaim was short-lived, and within three months, he plunged from hero to villain. Corbett's second wife, Vera, started divorce proceedings, accusing her husband of cruelty, adultery, and of being anything but a gentleman. To make matters worse, Mrs. Corbett accused her husband of fixing a recent fight with Kid McCoy. There were some rumors of the, about possibly being a fix before the fight happened. You have to keep in mind the context. The Horton Law had just been repealed. The Horton Law had allowed boxing to occur legally in New York. All the fighters said, oh no, our cash cow is now done for. We're not going to be able to make the kind of money we can make in New York anywhere. And they, so there was this speculation of, is this going to be a legit fight, or he's just trying to make a, a final payday before this law is repealed. They have the fight. Everyone that sees the fight says it's legit. Corbett's wife comes out and says the fight was fixed. But what made things worse was Kid McCoy was also divorcing his wife at the time. So his wife came out and said that she knew the fight was fixed also. Ultimately, most of the reporters that really looked closely did not believe the story. Barring a few exhibitions, the McCoy fight was the last anyone saw of Corbett in a ring for three years. But by the summer of 1903, the champion Jim Jeffries had run out of credible opponents, and at nearly 37 years of age, Gentleman Jim was lured back for one more shot at the title. No film survives of the fight, but the story of the contest was preserved for posterity by an enterprising movie maker from Philadelphia, Sigmund Lubin. The fake fight film is really a, a short-lived phenomenon, but not out of step with what most motion pictures were doing in the late 19th and very early 20th century. So it takes advantage of this moment when the public is not used to seeing anything recorded, much less a prize fight, which the majority of the public had never seen live because of its illegal status in most places. So if you were to reenact something on a stage or for a camera, uh, this would have been a, a normal experience for someone going to the theater. But there was definitely a vogue, of, especially around 1899 to 1901, uh, when one company in particular, a Philadelphia-based company called the Lubin Company, uh, which had very good photographic uh, equipment that it had developed and patented and also had included prize fight fans among its production crews. So their proximity to New York led them to uh, frequently try to record fights and when they found out they couldn't, they just began a kind of cottage industry of uh, getting uh, boxers off, off the, from the local club to reenact famous fights and putting names on them. Corbett was unable to repeat his heroics of the first match, and he was knocked out in 10 rounds. His fighting career ended on the canvas, back where it all began in San Francisco. Jeffries, meanwhile, took one more fight and promptly retired undefeated. And with Jeffries and Corbett gone, a chapter in boxing history had come to an end, and a new champion would emerge that would shake America to its core. At the height of the Jim Crow era, Jack Johnson became the first African-American world heavyweight boxing champion. This was a time when black men were sometimes beaten for talking back to whites. Yet Johnson spoke as if he were an equal or a superior. He was white America's worst nightmare. And so began the search for a white man to defeat the black champion, a great white hope. The heavyweight champion is the symbol of masculinity in America. 
the fear of losing to a black man and, 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 and a black man to be raised the pinnacle, uh, that, 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 that was a great fear that wasn't expressed in those words, but that was a lot what was behind it. Even though he was in his mid-40s by now, Corbett vowed that if no one else was prepared to do it, he'd come back and fight Johnson himself. Fortunately for Corbett, his old opponent, Jim Jeffries, was persuaded to leave his farm, come out of retirement, and regain the title for the white race. An overweight and out of condition Jeffries brought Corbett into his training camp to advise on tactics and to act as chief of propaganda. Take it from me, that black boy has a yellow streak, Corbett said of Johnson, leading one commentator to remark that Corbett was the most vocal racist in Jeffrey's corner. He hated all blacks, but Johnson more than the rest. As the day of the johnson Jeffries fight approached, Corbett's old rival, John L. Sullivan, showed up at the training camp to report on the events for the New York Times. If both Corbett and Sullivan disliked Jack Johnson, they disliked each other even more. They argued, and for a while it seemed that the two would trade blows just like they had in the ring nearly 20 years previously. But this was supposed to be a battle of black against white, and the old enemies were enticed to shake hands as a show of solidarity. This staged reconciliation lasted for as long as the cameras were rolling, and the hostility between Corbett and Sullivan never died. The Jeffries Johnson fight in 1910, the film version is preceded with footage uh, showing training scenes, but principally John L. Sullivan making a rare appearance on film. Corbett was also part of that uh, entourage of people in Jeffrey's corner and was a, you know, ghost wrote a, a column in sports pages, was there for the fight. Uh, many journalists who later wrote about Corbett's role in there talked about him race baiting Jack Johnson. So that handshake of solidarity from John L. Sullivan is, is really show white solidarity of trying to pass the heavyweight championship belt down through these ranks. Sixteen thousand spectators swamped Reno, Nevada on the day of the fight, July 4th, 1910. Bands played the Star Spangled Banner, and the streets were lined with American flags. Jeffries lost over 100 pounds in training for the fight. And despite being out of the ring for six years, hundreds of thousands of dollars were bet on him, making him the favorite to win back the title. It only took a couple of rounds before everyone on the arena knew Jeffries was beaten. It was only a question of how long Johnson would permit him to remain standing. The torture was prolonged by Johnson's desire to prove his superiority beyond any doubt. He slowly reduced Jeffries to a pathetic, blood-soaked mess. In the film of the fight, Corbett can be clearly seen in the early rounds trying to rile Johnson, shouting insults at him from the corner. His voice rose above the others at ringside. In the sixth round, Johnson put his arms around the battered and staggering Jeffries and pushed him around the ring to where Corbett was standing. Where do you want me to put him, Mr. Corbett? He asked, grinning broadly. Corbett had little to say to Johnson after that. When the end came for Jeffries in the 15th round, Corbett couldn't bear to look. After the referee had stopped the contest, Corbett led Jeffries back to his corner. The former champions had failed to win back the title for the white race, and that afternoon in Reno, Corbett and Jeffries both left the ring for good. Ladies and gentlemen, over here, him, over here. Why, here's two familiar faces. Walter Cassidy and Willie Collier. <laughs> Say, Mr. Corbett, you don't fight anymore, do you? Oh, no. I haven't had the gloves on years. Mm. I'm sorry, Jim. With all these big purses they're giving now. Oh, a lot of money in it. Yeah, 
million dollars for a bout. And only a few rounds. Yes. You didn't get that kind of money in your time, Jim. I should oh. say not. You know, Willie, what I got when I fought John L. Sullivan? No. I know what you got when you fought Fitzsimmons. How are you feeling, Walter? From the time he became champion of the world back in 1892, Corbett had really only been a part-time boxer. Most of his time had been spent on the stage, and he'd carved out a career as one of theater's biggest draws. When his fighting career was over, cinema was flourishing, and film companies were on the lookout for potential movie idols. With a national following in vaudeville, Corbett was a natural leading man. I think he has quite a legitimate claim to being called a movie star and a film star. I mean, just in terms of who came first and who did what and who got paid, a, uh, signed a movie contract to appear before cameras, that's, that's certainly the precedent. Um, and he also had relationships with movie companies and uh, kept that even after he retired from the ring. So I think and it's also the case that because what we now call movies, theatrical, uh, feature-length fiction films, story films, those weren't around in the era that he was champion and after. So the form that movies took in the early 20th century, his was the most commercially successful form for uh, more than a decade. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. One. Telephone, two. Mr. Corbett. Oh, say I can't come to the phone. I'm working with dumbbells. The idea! Come on, come on, snap into it now. One. Estimates of Corbett's total earnings from his various ventures were as high as $4.5 million. Yet, in his later days, his financial health was something of a mystery. Like most American investors, he suffered losses in the great stock market crash of 1929. But the root of his financial woes may go back a decade earlier to one of the great frauds in American history. Here in 1919 is Charles Ponzi, self-styled financial wizard, loafing at his Boston mansion with his lovely wife and proud and adoring mother. Ponzi's proved his boast he can make 50% profit on investments in 90 days, and wise men follow him. To show he doesn't do it with mirrors, Ponzi opens shop on Boston stage with Billy B. Van as office boy. And among his celebrated clients is none other than gentleman Jim Corbett. Ponzi puts over his usual big deal. But the audience that watches Spellbound here is later dumbfounded when government proves Ponzi a swindler. Corbett's personal life at this time was in stark contrast to his reputation as an inveterate womanizer during his days as a prize fighter. He and his second wife, Vera, lived a life of apparent tranquility in Bayside, New York, without the merest whiff of scandal. But then, in 1919, Gentleman Jim was seen around town with the Empress of Sex. Mae West appeared on the scene. Now, whether their friendship ever developed beyond the just good friend stage is open to conjecture. Neither ever admitted to it, but you've only got to look at the reputations of both of them to surmise that. If the call came to come up and see me sometime, Corbett was ready. There was an occasion where her current squeeze, the accordionist, Guido Diero, went to her dressing room in, in the theatre and found a man's hat and coat draped over a chair, flew into a rage and um, demanded to know, who is this, is your latest boyfriend? Tell me who he is, I'll go find him and punch him on the nose. Just then, there was a knock on the door, in walked James A. Corbett. Pardon me, I've left a couple of my items here and walked out again. And as Mae West recorded in her autobiography, there was no noses punched that night. Corbett was now in his 50s and too old to play the leading man. His vaudeville act had run its course, but he switched with great success to the lecture platform. He gave talks on physical fitness, manliness and sportsmanship and he always wound up with amusing tales of his exploits in the prize ring. Well, now, would uh, you advise a young man to take up prize fighting as a career? Well, no. I wouldn't advise a boy to take up boxing as a profession. Now, get me right. Not that I'm ashamed of boxing or ashamed that I was a boxer. Well, I'm very proud of that. 
not alone helped me in a business way, but uh, it kept me young and gave me a great constitution. But my reason for not wanting a boy to take up the profession is that the chances are so small for him to get anywhere. When you realize there are thousands of boys striving to become champions, and so few of them do. Corbett, as an actor, certainly used his reputation as a fighter. But uh, there's no doubt in his lifetime that Corbett uh, made much more money as an actor than he ever did as a fighter. When you consider what he did for most of his life, not only in terms of making money, but in terms of the amount of time he spent in these fields, he spent much, much more, much, much more time as an actor than he ever did as a fighter. Remember, he only had about 20 full-fledged Queensboro pro fights. You know, his presence as a public speaker, as a vaudeville uh, show person, as a, a presence on film, as a newspaper columnist, uh, all kinds of things um, made him uh, a celebrity and a media figure in the sense that we usually think of that today. Hello, Jim. Oh, hello, Damon. I brought a friend with me. What's his name? Mark Hellinger. Oh, hello, Mark. I'm After his file. precedent, it became almost de rigueur that anyone who rose to a the status of heavyweight champion had to think about what their media career was going to be like because that's where the majority of the money was still going to come. At first it was from personal appearances and kind of constantly touring theatrical and vaudeville circuits and then eventually we're used to seeing heavyweight champions and other celebrity boxers become personalities who perform on TV or get their own feature film built around them and so on. How are you Mr. Corby? I represent the Physical Weekly. You represent it weekly, all right. That's Mr. Corbett. Oh, Mr. Corbett, our paper wants to know how a man as old as you are keeps so physically fit. And I might add, it's a splendid opportunity for you to get your picture in the papers. Oh, that's good for a laugh. I'd like to get your autobiography, Mr. Er, er. I first worked in a bank out west. How long a stretch did you get for that job, Jim? Now, no boarding house quacks, Helen. Just then I went into prize fighting. Oh, you used to be a prize fighter. That's very interesting. Say, uh, I've seen glass jaws and smashed a few, but that head is the nearest thing to a goldfish bowl I've ever encountered. I'll give young journalism a chance to catch up, Jim. Did you ever hear of John L. Sullivan? Can't say that I have. Jim Jeffries, Jack Johnson, Bob Fitzsimmons, Terry McGarver. Waiter, quick, a telephone. Did you ever hear of William Muldoon? Oh, the contractor. Um, at the round table was Corbett's last acting part. Within a few years, his health had deteriorated rapidly, and on the 18th of February, 1933, Jim Corbett died at the age of 66. All over the world, newspapers devoted generous column inches to the departed champion. And whatever Corbett's impact on stage, screen, and society at large, it was, of course, as a heavyweight champion of the world, that he was best remembered. Corbett's legacy is, uh, well, is the man who created the modern Queensbury boxer. When I say modern, well, I mean the Queensbury boxer per se. There's no doubt he's the man responsible for the triumph of Queensbury boxing over bare knuckle prize fighting. And in doing this, he helped to create, create the modern sport of boxing. Corbett had a tremendous influence on boxing. He refined the art of boxing. Fighters copied his style. And in each generation, there was a fighter, just like Corbett had beaten the seemingly unbeatable brute Sullivan. Every generation of professional boxing has that same scenario played out by fighters who basically are using the same strategy that Corbett used to beat Sullivan. So here we have, a generation later, Gene Tunney, the most scientific heavyweight of his era, using a similar style of Corbett, defeating a seemingly unbeatable brute, Jack Dempsey, using the art of boxing, the sweet science, the father of which was Jim Corbett.
Nine years after his death, Corbett's life was given the Hollywood treatment in Gentleman Jim. It seemed fitting that the part of one of the first matinee idols was played by one of the ultimate matinee idols. Corbett, who never allowed the facts to spoil a good story, certainly when it came to his own story, would surely have approved of Earl Flynn's portrayal of him as a jaunty, devil-may-care dude who gets the title and the girl. Paging Mr. Corbett. Paging Mr. Corbett. Paging gentleman Jim Corbett. Gentleman Jim is my favorite boxing movie of all time. I mean, there have been hundreds, I don't know how many hundreds of boxing films made, but I thoroughly enjoy that movie for its, its depiction of an era, uh, its humor, uh, its pathos. I mean, it has everything. It's a great movie made by a great director, and Errol Flynn was the perfect gentleman, Jim. The one and only James J. Corbett. His adventures made old San Francisco gayer. He always did his best work in the clinches, the picture everybody is cheering for with Errol Flynn as Gentleman Jim Corbett, a gentleman who became a fighter in the days when fighters on the Barbary Coast weren't exactly gentlemen. Alexis Smith, that great American beauty as the Belle of Knob Hill. Jack Carson, he's a riot as a Barbary Coast playboy. Ward Bond as the immortal John L. Sullivan himself. Alan Hale as Pop Corbett, always ready for a fight or a frolic. Do you see that hand? Well, you're gazing on the hand that shook the hand of John L. Sullivan. Why, you fresh brush? Who do you think you're talking to? John L. Sullivan, himself. I'll have you know I can lick any man in the world. All except one, sir. All except one. Is that all? There is another scene in the movie. It's at the very end. Corbett is celebrating at his victory party. And John L. comes in. And he says to Jim Corbett, I don't know what it will mean to the game. I'm paraphrasing here. But I think what you've done is to bring something good to the game. And for that, I'm glad. And I wish you luck. And, and he walks away. And everybody's quiet. I mean, it was very poignant. And, and, and Corbett gets reflective, and he goes, you know, I really like the man. And I realize now that one day that's going to be me. I'm going to lose the title. And it was just a wonderful scene. It's a film that's worthy of its subject.